Welcome everybody. Hi, I wish we were all in the same room, but this is as close as we can be right now. Um, when, uh, when Lori was saying that we're going to do this on every Monday at four o'clock, during this time of shutdown, I'll be offering um, a class every Monday at four o'clock. These will be free classes and they will have to do with virus, with the uncertainty that we're in right now, and with the opportunities that are created from being in the situation that we're in. And so, uh, you know, I like to think about this period of time as being extraordinary. It's nothing that has ever happened in my life previously, and I'm sure it hasn't in yours either. And uh, it offers many opportunities as, uh, as we are taking this one to be together. I would not have been able to do this before this shutdown from the virus. And so uh, the virus actually has opened doors as well as shut doors. So while we're shut down at home or we're in a situation where we can't go out for our typical entertainment, we also have the possibility for a kind of home retreat and also for learning new things, especially about ourselves and our own minds because we're having to look at our minds maybe more completely than we typically do. So um, the topic that uh, I'll be talking about today, I actually entered into when I did a blog for Psychology Today a few, a few weeks ago. Uh, and I do have a Psychology Today blog that has picked up on some of the issues surrounding the virus. But the blog was called Don't Wage War on COVID-19. Don't Wage War on COVID-19. And the reason I did that blog was because I realized, and this was at the period of time where this idea of war was being offered for the first time on the mass media, I realized that we were entering into this frame of mind that is called war. And that this is a very problematic, but very enticing frame of mind for homo sapiens, for human beings. Uh, we, from, and I've said this in my other, my other pod, my podcast, I have a podcast called From War to Wisdom, it's Enemies from War to Wisdom. I say this often on the podcast and I've said this uh, on my, in my other classes. 95% of the time that our species has been on earth, we've been at war and often in continuous war. And so I want you to know that so that you recognize how attractive war is. You may think that peace or harmony be more attractive to human beings, but because the way that our mind works, we tend to want to divide things up into what you could call opposites or dualities or contraries. Um, and because we divide them up that way, uh, and because they deal with the two sides of our existence, we tend to want to identify ourselves with the good side. So we can think of our existence here on earth as an existence that is ambivalent, it is impermanent, it is uh, also in many ways impersonal. I don't mean by that the idea that the universe doesn't care about us, but rather that all of us exist in causes and conditions, contingencies that we don't create and we cannot control. We cannot control. So in that sense, no matter you know, how kind, generous, how open-hearted you are, you don't control the outcomes of what you're doing. And that, that's frustrating for us as, as human beings, as homo sapiens. So given that we live in this world, which Buddhists call samsara, you probably heard that term, and I will be using, particularly in this class, a number of Buddhist terms, but I will go into them. Um, samsara really means the, the wheel of life and death. And on this wheel of life and death, or you could say this place called earth, uh, death and life 
are bound together. Life and death cannot be separated. You must have noticed this yourself, that anything that comes into life comes into death simultaneously. Consequently, we actually need to be embracing both sides of the wheel of life and death. And in the same way that life and death are bound together, good and bad are bound together. Control and surrender are bound together. And many, many other opposites, all of the opposites that you can think of, love and hate, are bound together. And what that means is that in our experience, we cannot truly ever protect ourselves from these negative aspects because they're part of our existence. And as soon as we try to, particularly if we try to really vanquish the negative side of things, like make war on an enemy, what happens is that we begin, we begin to enter into a condition that actually puts the other side of whatever it is we're going to be making war on also at risk because that's bound up. Both sides are together. So, you know, you've probably noticed in recent times that we have made war on cancer. We've made war on drugs we've made war on terrorism. And you've noticed that none of these wars end, none of these wars lead to anything good, and they often lead to attacks on the vulnerable. You could say even in the war on cancer, instead of looking at cancer in terms of the overall organism of the human body and how it interacts with that organism, you know, we kind of blast it out with shock and awe but with various kinds of chemotherapies and other things that attack it. And then we attack the healthy tissue as well because the cancer is bound up with the healthy tissue. So when you could see deeply into this condition that we're living in, this samsara, this life and death bound together, when you take the time to see deeply into it, you realize that waging war is a very big mistake because when you wage war on something, it's bound to the other something. Uh, consequently, you know, from time to time and over the eons of time that Homo sapiens have been on Earth much longer than we originally thought, uh, we've made various rules for war to try to limit it, to try to make it more proportional and uh, um, the Chinese had a book by Sun Tzu called The Art of War. And in that book, um, Sun Tzu talks about the importance of actually fostering and helping your enemies once you defeat them, because they become your neighbors. Because once you've defeated them and you join into their community, then you have to live with them and so you need to help them. And so, you know, back at the time that that was written, which I think is the fifth century, but I'm not sure, um, the, uh, there, were, there were rules that people were trying to follow to make war more, let's say, a humane or even understandable. Um, so let me just talk a little bit more about the conundrum of these opposites and how life and death fits, fit together. And then I will be talking a little bit about uh, the idea of war, the fog of war, and what happens when we make war on another person, a tribe, a society, uh, aspects of the living world, anything. It creates a certain state of mind, and that state of mind then dominates instead of anything else. So uh, I, I want to first just talk a little bit more about the conditions that we're in here um, in this world of life and death. Um, these conditions actually require embracing what we could call the negative side of our experience uh, as uh, important as the positive side. 
And when you can do that, you feel a lot safer. When you can embrace, for example, death and recognize that death actually, of course, is inevitable and it's present because you're living, because you're, you know, it's like you, you signed a contract when you came in here that said you were going to die. And from the moment that you started, you were dying. So again, if you begin to get interested in death and dying, not even from the perspective of, oh, you know, we need to do various things to help people who are dying, but maybe perhaps more from the perspective of thinking about your own dying and about the conditions you would want to bring about for your dying and to recognize that dying is part of living and uh, from a Buddhist perspective, the actual transition of dying is a very, very important transition. Uh, and from the traditions that I study, the actual moment of death is one of the most important moments in your life, your so-called life, because at that moment, you're meeting the ground of consciousness. And if you can be conscious when you're actually dying, you have tremendous opportunities for waking up and for understanding the conditions you've been in. So the actual experience of death and dying, um, being interested in death as part of life, recognizing that you can't stomp it out, that you can't destroy it, that you can't vanquish it, that you actually can't be immortal. And I know there are people in Silicon Valley who've been working on immortality, but that's not the first time that human beings have tried that. I mean, you know, Gilgamesh is about immortality. It goes way back. Uh, it just ain't going to work because life and death are bound together. So in this particular world we live in, uh, the immortality bit does not belong to the Homo sapiens, nor to any of the other beings that we recognize as being here. They're also on the life and death situation. So um, being able to embrace this, this world of life and death, being interested in death, not fighting with death so much, not thinking of it as the enemy, not pushing it away, not assuming that it's always going to be the bad thing over your shoulder. That's the attitude that we can cultivate in this period of time when we're all thinking a lot more about how many beings are dying at any moment. We have these calculators that calculate how many human beings are dying in different places on the earth. Uh, if you actually think about that completely, you'll recognize that life and death are zooming in and out. I mean, if you think of every insect, every microorganism, every animal, every human, all of these things are wishing in and out. They're coming in and they're going out. Um, and this morning I was, I was out walking and a little vole crossed my path. And I realized that that vole was in the total kind of whirlwind of life and death. And uh, then I began to look around at all the little beings. And it's once you recognize how much is living and dying around you, you have a different appreciation for it. So then the idea of making war on a particular virus starts to seem a little peculiar. It starts to seem like, you know, that's a ridiculous idea. And, um, and yet you need to pay attention because all around you and all around me are a lot of um, messages about making war on the virus and also about uh, vanquishing the virus. So I, I don't want to get into the technicalities of viruses uh, because I probably know more now than I've ever known about viruses because I've been reading it. But just to say briefly that, that the coronavirus is a cold virus. You may have noticed that we haven't had any vaccines against cold viruses ever. And colds have always been troubling to our species. We don't like them. They come and go seasonally, usually. And uh, 
I know I have my regular October cold and sometimes it's a long deal and sometimes it's a shorter one, but I always, when I have that cold, think, wow, you know, we humans haven't conquered the common cold. And, uh, you know, how do we think we can conquer these other diseases? So the coronavirus is a cold virus and um, the coronavirus is gonna be with us. We don't know, of, we don't know yet a lot about it. We're just learning about it because it's a new virus. We don't really know its origins. We don't know how it got out into the human population. We do seem to know that it probably started in China and that it came quickly to the West. And probably that's because the part of China that it started in was the part that manufactures a lot of iPhones and was the beginning for 5G for that form of electromagnetic uh, digital stuff that I'm not sure what to call it, but it's uh, like a radar. So um, we know that we were doing a lot of commerce with that part of the world, we Westerners, and probably it was because we were in touch with trying to get products that we want, that we got the virus over here so quickly. In any case, a viruses adapt to us and we adapt to viruses and at any moment your body is just full of trillions of microorganisms and they're trying to find some way to, uh, to live there together in some kind of harmony within your gut and your brain and your, uh, and your breathing system and so on. So, you know, the idea that we're gonna sort of stamp out this particular cold virus, not very likely, not very likely. The idea that we're gonna get a vaccine against it anytime soon, I would say, if, if the past predicts the future in any way, not that likely. So what we need, I think we need to do is to start be interested in the virus, be interested in it, read about what's going on to research it. Don't look at it as a bad thing. Look at it as another thing, something that you will be living alongside of and you've been living alongside of coronaviruses or along with coronaviruses for a long time. And so if you look at it that way, you begin to look at the conditions of being here as a blend of life and death, you can learn a lot from that. And that's, that's not to say also, that's not to say at all that, um, that we human beings uh, who are strongly oriented towards our relationships with others, uh, that we don't uh, really grieve over the loss of any particular person we should and we do. And also to know that as you lose people through dying, you do feel very strong feelings about their loss. Your own transition through death might be different. And it might be something that you find very interesting, compelling, and welcoming when you go through it. Just to know, again, that this dying thing is very, very interesting and going on all the time. So, um, so let me switch channels then a little bit and, um, and do a little bit of Buddhist teaching here because I'm going to talk about uh, the importance of keeping track of your, of your frame of mind and um, in relation not only to this virus, but also to all of the things that surround you in terms of the way you regard what you take to be the world and yourself. In all of these classes, I do a little bit of teaching on some of the Buddhist ideas, often in the framework of their psychological meaning. So I'm taking this slide, it's from Tanisara Bhikkhu's commentary on his translation of the opening of something called the Dhammapada, which is the most popular teaching from the Buddha, from the actual time of the Buddha. And so again, this is the commentary from a Western uh, Buddhist monk who is a Theravada monk for those people who know those categories. And he says that Buddhism teaches that all that we experience, the world as well as the self, is created by thought or the cognitive process of sense perception and conception. So let me just stop with that for a moment and say that the way that the Buddha states it is with your mind, you make the world. So the world is actually generated moment to moment to moment. 
through your conscious awareness. Now, that seems counterintuitive at first, but then if you take a step back and you recognize that you never have a perception of anything, whether it's a body sensation or a brick hitting you on the head or the sky or the wall or anything, you never have a perception without your conscious awareness, without your mind lighting it up, even when you're dreaming. So it's not like there's something out there and there's something in here. There's just something. Now, let me say it from the perspective of cognitive science, because usually Westerners get this a little better. Anything that you perceive goes through, it's, it's basically a group of kinds of impulses that go through your entire nervous system and bounce back to your cortex before you can see it or hear it, hear it or taste it or feel it or touch it or anything. So everything you perceive is individual and it's subjective. And in terms of the consensus that we have that there's a sky up there and there's the floor beneath us or the walls are there or whatever, that consensus is pretty weak. We're all enclosed in our own subjective experiences. Those experiences are anywhere between 45% and 85% individual or idiosyncratic at any moment. So moment by moment. So again, I'll leave a little bit of that mystery there, standing there. But what I want you to get is that the mind precedes the world. So there's no mind and body. There's mind that creates body, body sensations, the experience of being inside a body with the world out there. If you know anything about developmental psychology or development, you've had a baby, you know that that baby gradually organizes a sense of being inside of its body. And that occurs between, start to see how that works between about 18 months and two years when that little being says, no, I'll do it myself. And that little being says, essentially, I'm in here and the world is out there and I have to protect myself. So that is a developmental creation also. When, when the human infant is born, is born, the perceptions are very, um, very disorganized. The body and the world are not organized until there's been some considerable development. Um, so let's put the slide up again. I want to do the second part of it uh, before I get into the state of war. So the Buddha states clearly that the world, the beginning of the world, the end of the world, and the way leading to the end of the world are all in this body with its perceptions and conceptions. In other words, this world arises with you, is arising all the time, and your perceptions of it are only accessed to you through what we call your mind. And so what you call your body is also a mental construction. And it is something, again, that didn't arrive with your birth. You had to develop enough to construct it. And there's a, there's a lot of research on this, folks, and I will be talking about it in the class that I'm teaching on um, living together without falling apart. I'll be talking about the way the human self develops and the way that we come to perceive the world out there and the complexity of our subjective experience. And because of this complexity, the difficulties that we have and agreeing with each other and the difficulties we have in going through conflicts because we're all experiencing slightly different worlds. So I'm going to leave this slide right now. And um, what, I, what I'm wanting to get across in this, in this moment is that uh, the way that you, uh, the way that you color your perceptions, the mood, the emotion that you bring moment to moment to moment has a very strong effect on the way you perceive everything that's happening around you and within you. In other words, it's not something out there that allows you to feel safe. It's you. 
And if you learn how to deal with the conundrum of life and death and how to pay attention to what's around you, you start to feel confident and safe. You have even confidence in dying. So Dying with Confidence is the name of a book by Anya Rinpoche, which is a book about Tibetan teachings on dying. It's a nice little book. So uh, that sense that we have that we want to be safe, we tend to externalize it to the other. We think that somebody else or something else is doing something to us to make us unsafe. But in fact, if we can pay attention moment by moment by moment, we can create a state of mind in which we're really pretty safe because we know how to cope with the opposites of life. And those opposites don't get so split apart as to be like strangers to each other, like life is a stranger to death or good is a stranger to bad or happiness is a stranger to sadness. When they're split far apart, we prefer one or the other. We're always trying to juggle to get the one and get rid of the other, not possible to do. And then we could take things to the extreme and try to make war on one in order to embrace the other. So I'm going to talk then a little bit about hostility. Um, so if I, maybe I'll stop for a moment and take a, a question. If there's a, a question there, Maury, that, uh, that you think might clarify some of what I'm seeing so far. Yeah, I'd sure. Um, so we had a question. Um, so did we have to kind of feel ourselves into a body, question mark, sort of create our bodies through a type of boundary sensation? So that was one question. And then um, also someone also asked what creates thought, which I think is kind of probably a, a class unto itself, but I'll, I'll leave you with those two. Right, right, right. Well, body question is a really good one. And um, if any of you know the work of Jean Piaget, I know some of you do. I've seen some faces in the group here to know that. And um, so Piaget, who was a biologist who became a child developmentalist, uh, talks about the sensory motor period of development in infancy. And that is the infant from birth until about, uh, well, really it goes on until about two years old when cognitive thought becomes really important. But the infant is, is pushing and pulling on things. The way the infant knows the world is by kicking and grasping and holding and pushing away. That allows the infant to construct the sense of a, of a body with boundaries and other things around it that also have boundaries. And then cognitions develop from that that give us a sense that something is inside and something, out is, something else is outside. So yes, the body is constructed and the body is also constructed, and this is hard to get, but moment by moment by moment, but if you notice sometimes, if you come out of a deep dream and you seem to have been in the dream, you know, when you're in the dream, oddly enough, you've got a body, but it's not this one. Sometimes you're in another body, maybe you're the opposite sex or you're an animal or whatever. And if you come out of a deep dream state and you wake suddenly, you'll notice that your embodiment feels a little weird. You'll, you'll be kind of jerked back into your body. Similarly, if, you're, if you've ever had out-of-the-body experiences, and I mean the kinds of things like during childbirth, you pop out of the body, time and space, stop, et cetera, or if you've been in a car accident where that's happened, you realize that it takes a while to reconstruct that body. And I'm sure for people who have traumatic brain injuries, I know that there are different things that happen with their bodies. Um, you could have phantom limbs and so on if you've had a paralysis or you've lost a limb. I can't go into this in great depth, but yes, you do construct the body. And yes, it is a developmental achievement and, uh, and so on. And uh, thought, oh gosh, you're right, Laurie, that's a whole class. Um, I, I, I can say just this, that every perception that we have, once we get to be an adult, 
tends to pretty quickly get interpreted by a word. So if I look at something in front of me, I have a tendency to say tree, leaf, insect, instead of, oh, like an infant might, oh, change in perception, oh, oh, something, oh, huh, mm. You know, we go quickly into thought, and thought is both verbal and image. So it's, it's, there's, we have thoughts that are in images, and we have thoughts that are in words. We tend to cover a lot of our experience with words once we get to be adults. So that's a quick lesson on thought. So I'm going to change the channel. Thanks for those questions. And of course, you can send the question, or Lori will send me the questions that you, uh, that you write out to her during, um, during the class. Uh, so we're going to put the slide up now on hostility and hatred, because that'll lead us to war. So uh, this is, again, from the Dhammapada. This is the translation by Tanisara Bhikkhu, whose name I think is Greg Smith, his Western name. I can't really remember his last name right now. But in any case, what you want to recognize is that Tanisara Bhikkhu is, um, is an American person who's done a lot of work and a lot of translation, spent his entire life as a Buddhist monk. Um, this is one of the most important teachings uh, that is in the Dhammapada. And uh, I think if it sinks deeply into you as a result of this virus being in the world, it'll be a great, great teaching. Hostilities aren't stilled through hostility. Regardless, hostilities are stilled through non-hostility. This, an unending truth. And another translation would be that hatred is never stopped by hatred. Hatred is only stopped by non-hatred. This is an eternal law. And so any time that we have a frame of mind of hostility, when we create that frame of mind, it leads to more hostility. It never leads to less hostility. And that is an eternal law. So if in the Dhammapada, the Buddha next says, if you go around saying, he beat, he beat me, he lied to me, he abused me, hostility will follow you like the cart follows the ox. If you go around and you don't say, he beat me, he abused me, he lied to me, then non-hostility will follow you like the cart follows the ox. So I hope you can see in this very brief teaching, there is a tremendous teaching about war. And one thing that has always been clear to me about the overall framework of the teachings of Buddhism and even the Buddha, because Buddhism is about 2,600 years old and there's, there are lots and lots of teachings, uh, but this very fundamental teaching of not killing. At its root, it means not killing the mind of compassion. That means your attitude towards all things that are here, but especially the beings that are here, that you don't kill your compassion towards the beings here by developing hatred and hostility for some of those beings in a way that would allow you then to end their lives prematurely so that they don't go through their entire life cycle but are ended by you. Now, again, this is a complex idea, and I can't go into it in depth, but what it really means is don't get too literal about stepping on insects, but if you step on an insect, then regard that insect as dying with some compassion instead of hating the insect. And so it's very much of a different attitude than war where you kill in war in order to achieve a victory. 
you kill in order to preserve yourself. And then you hate those that you kill. And so you sustain and go on with that hostility even after their death. Um, so this idea of hatred never being the cure for hatred is a subtle teaching. Uh, what it does lead to in Buddhism that's different from other world religions is that there is never in Buddhism any excuse for war. So the first precept is not to kill. There's no footnote that says you can kill during war. In the Ten Commandments, there's a footnote. I, I believe also in, um, well, I mean, the Ten Commandments, Commandments covers all of the Abrahamic religions. Um, and I know in the Hammurabi Code, there were big footnotes on killing all sorts of beings. Um, so in a lot of world religions, there are exceptions when you can kill. In Buddhism, there is not. And I think one reason why there is not is because there's a recognition that all of this has to do with your own frame of mind. And so your frame of mind is what you're always, always working with. And so there are no exceptions for killing out of hatred or killing out of anything. Now, that doesn't mean that you never kill or that you don't kill to protect, but there are elaborate teachings around those conditions and they're not really relevant at this moment. What's relevant at this moment is the frame of mind that we have toward the COVID-19 virus because that's where I started this whole thing and that's what I want to get back to. So um, I want to look for a moment at the issue of war and then um, after, I, after I talk about war, talk about conflict, then I'll, I'll take some more questions. And so, you know, feel free to be writing more of your questions. Um, so first of all, the word war actually comes from uh, its etymological root is in an Indo-European language. It comes from veris or verse. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. It's a W-E-R or W-E-R-S. And it means confusion or being mixed up. And so even the root word for war has to do with confusion. The, uh, what you learn, if you look deeply into what happens when um, human beings are at war, is that war creates a state of mind and that has been called the fog of war. Like once you actually enter into war, you no longer can think straight. You can no longer actually even keep in mind what your reasons were for going into war. And you can't keep in mind like who you're fighting or why, because the state of mind is so confusing. The Prussian general who's credited with naming the fog of war is Karl von Clausewitz, and he made the observation War is the realm of uncertainty. Three quarters of the factors on which action is based are wrapped in a fog of greater or lesser uncertainty. So once we go into this attitude of making war on something, we lose our ability to perceive in a fine-toned way. Um, you know, so as you, as you are understanding it, even your, your body is constructed moment by moment. And when you get into a really confusing and overwhelming state of mind where you are focused on killing an enemy or vanquishing an enemy, that leads to chaos and enormous confusion. And so every one of these wars we get into, whether it's a war in Iraq or it's a war in Afghanistan, Syria, um, I think I've forgotten how many wars we're in right now as a country. I think it's around 18 different wars. Um, every time we get into one of those or we get into the war on cancer, the war on terrorism, the war on... Uh, whatever else, we get into these 
confused states of mind in which we can no longer perceive what it is we're doing, we lose track of why we got going in the first place with all of this hostility. And then those wars never finish. There's no victory. There's no ending to them. They just go on and on. Now you could say, well, there was a, an end to World War I, but then it led into the conditions for World War II. There was the end of World War II, but Russia went on killing vast numbers of people. So it's, it's like one of these things, and then that probably led into various aspects of what happened in China. Whatever takes place in war never really ends unless there's a rule, like you know was set in place by Sun Tzu on the art of war, to stop and treat your enemies well. Otherwise, the condition of war just morphs into more war. And so um, the other kind of um, uh, uh, teaching on this that might be worth looking at right now, there are two things I would recommend. Um, one of them is uh, The Fog of War, which is a doc documentary by Earl Morrison. Um, and um, it's a long interview with the former Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, where he looks back at World War II and what we did to Japan, or what America did to Japan, before we, we dropped the bombs. We fire bombed all of their major cities uh, because of Pearl Harbor. Um, and uh, then he looks at Vietnam and what happened after we went to war in Vietnam and how much he regrets his, the role that he played in Vietnam. And he talks about the fog of war and he talks about it in depth and how it destabilizes our ability to think. That's one, one um, resource that I think is wise to look at right now. And another one is Fahrenheit 9-11, Michael Moore's movie of what took place after 9-11. Um, and how Americans quickly put in place the Patriot Act and we gave up a lot of our rights to privacy, which have not been reinstated. And then we went to war with Iraq. And we went to war, of course, with Afghanistan first. At least there was some reason to go to war with Afghanistan. There was no reason to go to war with Iraq. But in the framework, of hostility, retaliation, and war. Human beings do a lot of things to increase their hostilities in order to apparently bring about some sort of victory, but it doesn't work. And consequently, in this long period of time that we have been on Earth, we have been almost entirely at war, always. And there's been very little opportunity even to have something that might lead to dialogue, that might lead to understanding those others that we're at war with because of the confusion that is created by war itself. Once you see that, you see that if you can stop that impulse in your own mind to go to war, you begin to add to the possibility of something that I, I used to call peace. I don't really call it peace anymore. Um, when I started my life as an adult, of course, I was in the anti-war movement. And of course, I wanted to see a transformation of human beings. As I have continued over the years as a psychologist, a psychotherapist who sees couples, and now somebody who's working on real dialogue, I realize that peace is a far cry. I'm not sure that we can actually together be at peace, but I think we can be in dialogue. I think we can be interested in the differences of opinion that we have without going into war about those differences. I do think that's possible. Now, again, as I have been 
working with the hostilities of couple relationship, hostilities in our families, hostilities in our nation, I have come to see how difficult it is for people to talk with each other using words about views that are opposing views. And I have also seen that most wars are fought about ideals, not about resources per se. There was a time when I assumed that Homo sapiens fought more for resources or to protect themselves, but now we fight over ideals. And so if you can learn how to reduce your own capacity to be confused by war in your personal life, in relation to what surrounds you in your family, with your neighbors, in your community, at this time when you're at home on lockdown because of this virus, you know, possibly you can go through some of the doors that the virus is opening that are doors having to do with how we cope with uncertainty and how we deal with conflict, both the conflicts that take place in relation to, let's say, the virus and what the virus might mean to us and the conflicts that take place between us and other people who see the virus differently, who understand these conditions surrounding it differently, who have different views of the future or how it should be articulated. Instead of going to war, instead of making war, instead of silencing them or seeing them as the enemy or the deplorables or the ones who don't know what's going on, if you can instead be interested in talking with them, in finding a way to understand what they are thinking and realize that if you have a different opinion than somebody else, this is a very complicated world, this world of life and death. Why not find out about that other opinion? It might actually shed some light because you don't know that your opinion is the right one. You're not immortal. You're not omniscient. You just have a point of view. And if you can see that with some modesty at this time of anxiety and fear, it's possible that you could open a door to dialogue instead of war. On the other hand, with the situation that we're now in, it's also possible that we could go through that door of war once more. And that we could, because we get into the confusion that there is an enemy, either in the virus or there's an enemy in the people that think differently from us, we could go right through again to feeling like there's no alternative here except hostility. And if you can recognize, and I certainly recognize, that human beings, because we're so negatively motivated, because more of our emotions are negative than positive, because we remember what's wrong better than what's right, because we're very self-protective and we're self-promoting, because of all of those things, we're more easily attracted to hostility than we are to dialogue. And when you see that in yourself, you can start to work with it in yourself. And when you see it really clearly, you can start to see how you can make the world a different place moment by moment. You don't have to immediately address what's going on with climate change. What you have to address is how can you talk to the people who think differently from you about climate change? Climate change is not something that even the scientists agree on. People say, well, the scientists have said. If you look deeply into different opinions of scientists, you'll find that there are differences about what climate change is, what causes it, and also what we should do about it. So instead of assuming that there are a bunch of stupid people out there that don't know anything about science, if you could assume that we think a little differently, 
that we are 45 to 85 percent subjective in our perceptions. We have language to help us find out about what somebody else is thinking. We have the words, help me understand how it seems to you. What's it like from your point of view? Or we can go towards war. We can go towards those old hostilities in which there is something that needs to be eliminated because we can't tolerate it. So I'm, I'm gonna stop with that. And uh, I'm gonna ask Lori if there are questions that I could answer uh, at the end of, this will be the way we'll go out, we'll be with questions, okay? Lori? Yes. Yep, sure. We have some great questions and I'll let everyone know that if we don't get to your question in the next five minutes that we will be following up via email with the with uh, Polly's response. So um, so here's here's one. Uh, it seems the main obstacle to peace is having the illusion that we can control things inside and outside ourselves. Can you talk more about letting go of control in the face of the pandemic? Yes, that's a really great point. True. I mean, if you, if you think of it like this, in this world of life or death, we would like just one side to work out, you know? And so all of us, when we're involved with others, we really try to control what's going on because we, even if, because we want the best, you could say, because, but we, we believe that our own view of the best is the best view. And so if you actually, instead of, trying to manage somebody's emotional responses, somebody else's other than your own, or trying to get somebody to change their mind, those are control moves. If instead you just pay attention in the present moment to what's arising in your own mind, that is the way you're talking to yourself, the things you're saying, and also maybe some of the emotions that you're having in your body sensations and you track those pretty closely before you speak then you have the option of opening up something that is more compassionate that has true deep curiosity in it like help me see from your point of view instead of trying to get a result quickly which generally will be that you'll try to either persuade or predict or just straight out control what the other person is saying and so yes control you know in a certain way from a buddhist perspective it's called attachment grasping on to some kind of thing and, and just not letting it go or pushing away something but at the root of both attachment and aversion is this thing called ignorance, which is the confusion moment to moment about the fact that you are deeply woven into everything else that's arising with you. And so if you can allow with curiosity and compassion, all of the things that are arising with you, then actually your own welfare is better off always better off because you're not separated out from the other beings that means of course that moment to moment to moment you are allowing that but you're also discerning you know you don't turn into a rock or a tree you don't turn into even a dog who might have a lot less self-consciousness than you and so you keep on working with your discernment about what seems to be true about what seems to work and of course you don't stop protecting yourself you don't stop promoting yourself because you're a homo sapien and that's what we do and that's what we do always and we will do it always but you keep within that this desire to actually find out things instead of controlling them to be interested uh, all the way through your own dying moments you have that same attitude rather than pushing and pulling on your experience primarily as a first step you give it a pause and you wait and you see and you allow and then if you have some curiosity and some compassion you find that things take place in a way you could never have imagined so control plays a big a big big part 
inhuman hostilities. Is there another question? Yeah, sure. There's um, uh, a sort of couple of questions uh, on this topic. So in quotes, the war against the virus could easily lead to war against those who don't respect whatever rules are put in place to quote unquote protect us. So, and then someone also pointed out that um, the Roman belief is uh, in quotes, if you want peace, prepare for war. So I think um, those just sort of speak to uh, what you were talking about about 15 minutes ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that I, I'll, I'll do the Roman thing first. To me, that's the great example of what human beings do, you know. If you want peace, fight a war. Actually, war and peace are bound together in that way, you know. But I think that if you actually want to live as a human being and not simply as a homo sapien constantly at war, then actually expand your compassion and your curiosity and don't even look for peace. Don't even look for that. Just be interested moment to moment to moment. And you will find that peace and ease are built into your existence. You don't have to fight for them. Um, so then the other, the other question I think is a really important one. Because if you, if you watch Fahrenheit 9-11, you'll see how quickly we gave, we as a society, American society, gave up rights to privacy as a result of the fear that was also generated by media that we were so afraid that terrorists were going to come to Burlington, Vermont, make an attack. I mean, there were these ideas that terrorists were everywhere. And so we had to, we had to nail down these kinds of things where we could be surveilled all the time. And we are now surveilled all the time, and especially through our telephones, and especially through various kinds of digital things about our locations and so on. And so I think we need to be really, really careful in this period of time where we're making war on the virus or whatever, not to jump into this same kind of panic that we jumped into after 9-11. And we need to take those moments of uncertainty and pay attention to dialogue and talk to people who think differently from you and try to get a big picture of what you think makes sense in terms of America, our rights, our freedoms, what we take to be right to be here as a free individual. And then we need to work together. I don't have answers on exactly what should happen as a result of this pandemic, nor do I know how we should protect ourselves against future pandemics. So I'm reading and I'm listening. I'm actually also posting on my website on something called Pay Attention, the things that I'm reading and listening to. And I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to be curious, be interested in what's happening, but also to talk to people who think differently from me. And I think that's at the root of proceeding without war. It's, it's basically dialogue is something that human beings have available that the dogs don't have, that the monkeys don't have, that the insects don't have, even though dogs and monkeys and insects and dolphins all have language, but they can't do the back and forth that we can do where we can think abstractly about things that are not present in the moment. So we have these opportunities as human beings and we also have this propensity to create war. And if you recognize both sides of those, you'll find that living within our species becomes more interesting. Many people like other species better, but you know, if you were actually an elephant or a dolphin, this species might look good. So you know, I would encourage you to go deeply into dialogue with your species and to think about the idea of you have a natural compassion and a natural curiosity that can lead you away from more. So thank you very much for participating in this course. Thank you for your questions and I hope to hear from you. Thank you, I see friends there. Thank you very much, bye.